Baptist, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. John was described by Jesus as being, yes, a prophet, but also far more than a prophet. As he said, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way for you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John is right at the hinge between the old covenant and the new, between the age of law and the age of grace. It was a privileged position, the job of announcing the coming of the Messiah, preparing people through repentance and baptism to receive their Lord and Savior. And it was a job that John had prepared for all his life. And yet, in a sense, that exalted position really doesn't matter. He was, as scripture says quite clearly, just a voice, a messenger whose sole importance lay in his message. And what was that message? Well, it was kind of good news, bad news. The good news, of course, was that the Savior, the Messiah, was just about to reveal himself. Deliverance from sin, death, and oppression was on its way. But to receive that deliverance, each person would have to repent and turn from their corrupt and sinful ways and receive baptism as the outward sign of this inner rejection of evil. And John didn't pull any punches. I mean, if he had wanted to be popular and have a large following, he wouldn't have greeted the approaching crowds by saying, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? But that's what he did. The origin of the word repentance comes from a Latin word meaning, think again. It translates the Greek word metanoia, which means a transformation of the mind. So to all those who thought that by keeping the law and doing good works, they might be saved, that is, qualify for the new life in Christ's kingdom, John says, think again. And to those who thought that their high position in government or in the religious hierarchy would win them entrance, John said, think again. And the baptism he was calling the people to was one that was very demeaning for any Jew. Baptism was for new converts to Judaism. It wasn't for those who were born children of Abraham. So John was saying that all of his fellow Jews were no more worthy of salvation, of new life in the Lord's kingdom, than the lowest Gentile. It's no wonder that he wasn't universally popular. It's amazing that he had a following at all. As you probably know, he didn't just denounce all the people who came out to the banks of the Jordan to see him. He also denounced Herod Antipas, the successor of Herod the Great, for divorcing his wife, stealing his brother Philip's wife, his niece, actually, and then living with her in sin. Herod Antipas had him thrown in prison, and Herodias, seeking revenge, eventually managed to convince Herod to have the Baptist's head cut off. And sadly, all of these racy details of John's interaction with Herod, Herodias, John the Baptist, and Herodias's dancing daughter, Salome, are not in our readings for today. As you can imagine, artists had a field day, painting scenes of the banquet in which Salome danced, and Herodias making her have the Baptist's head severed from his body and delivered on a platter during the banquet. Power, sex, blood, and murder, artists have always had a field day with it. But we're going to concentrate on John's ministry and the baptism of Jesus. The inauguration of Jesus' ministry effectively draws the curtain on John's ministry. 
As he put it, he, that is Jesus, must increase, I must decrease. The voice, the messenger, has done what he had to do to prepare the way, and now he must yield to his Lord, to our Lord. And it's, in fact, a wonderful mountaintop moment in the life of Jesus. As the Son of God undergoes John's baptism, another voice, not John's this time, comes from heaven saying, you are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. To me, that's just an amazingly beautiful thing for a father to say and for a son or a daughter to hear. It must have been such a blessing for Jesus as he began his ministry to feel that kind of bedrock love and approval. He could face the future with a renewed kind of sense of support, of mission, and of purpose. It's something that each of us would have loved to have heard from our parents. And by the way, it's never too late for a person to say it. So let's take a look, John the Baptist and the baptism of Christ. An early image from Siena, and we've seen many like it by Duccio and others with the kind of Byzantine golden background and the predella scenes that show a really kind of primitive perspective. The reason art had not advanced since the early part of the 1300s was because the plague had swept through Florence and Siena and indeed through all of Europe during those intervening years and art was the last thing on people's minds, so everything had ground to a standstill. In John's hand is a scroll that reads Vox Clementis in Deserto, the, the motto of Dartmouth College, by the way, a voice crying in the wilderness. Art takes a sudden leap forward with Donatello, a very accomplished sculptor who had such an incredible variety of styles. We're looking at John the Baptist, emaciated, haggard, dressed in uh, very coarse skins, and he has his banner saying, Ecce, and it, it, the Agnus Dei, behold the Lamb of God, which is what he will say as he recognizes Jesus. How different this image is excuse me, this is the big altar that this is inset in, excuse me, in uh, Venice. He's here in the middle, surrounded by other saints. But how different this is from an earlier uh, image of David that we looked at last year when we were looking at the Old Testament, a very almost feline, androgynous image of David. And that just goes to show you the variety of styles of which Donatello was capable. This was made for the Medici family, who were his patrons. It was made to appear in the courtyard of their palazzo, and it's now in the Bargello in Florence. Next we come to Piero della Francesca, and you have seen his work before when we were studying the Annunciation. If you remember, he was the great mathematician as well as painter who really perfected perspective, wrote volumes on perspective and de abaco about mathematics, a very advanced mind, and you can see the perfect perspective in the arches as they go back, indicating the sacred space between the angel Gabriel and Mary, this space where the miracle takes place of the incarnation. So Piero now, uh, in years before he was becoming quite the mathematician, uh, creates this image of John the Baptist baptizing Christ. I wonder if you notice anything in particular about this. How does it impress you? It doesn't show you perspective as the image did of the Annunciation. Do you respond in any particular way to it? Does it seem like a very energetic or uh, um, static? Static is a good word. It's very stable, isn't it, as an image? 
And this is very deliberate on the part of Piero. If you can imagine coming down through here, Christ's uh, garment here completes a circle that goes around and comes on up here, which you'll see right there. This provides enormous solidity to the painting, this perfect geometric circle. And in the middle of it, of course, is the dove of the Holy Spirit. And if you were to bisect it, it comes right through between Jesus' eyes and through the hand of John, through Jesus' uh, praying hands, right down to the foot on which his weight is placed. So it's an extremely solid, uh, weighty picture, which is how we are supposed to respond to it, even though we may not know why we're responding that way. Taking it further, this line that is made by the tree cuts the picture into what is called the golden section. It has to do with proportions and ratios that we'll study in the weeks to come. But again and again, we find that this kind of proportional balance between parts of a picture is what human beings find pleasing to the eye and respond well to. If we carry this even further and take it from here into another third, which is what it is, and these are thirds, you get Jesus framed very nicely in that center panel and taking it just one step further, his navel is in the intersection of those thirds together with the Holy Spirit above him. And believe me, none of this is by chance. Piero intended this very deliberately so that you would feel the uh, kind of poised and, and weighty nature of the picture, that everything is balanced and even at this moment of Jesus' inauguration as the Messiah. There you have it. These almost look like three graces, but they are three angels. And one of them, which you can barely see here, but believe me, she is looking, or he is looking straight out at you, drawing you into the picture. What was the subject at the far, far right? This is another baptismal candidate taking off his garment, getting prepared for the baptism. And this is the wonderful reflection of the water that, that winds back here into the background. So there you have it. Another baptism by Verrocchio, and Verrocchio was a very great sculptor, also a painter, but his real metier was sculpting. And you perhaps can tell that by the somewhat awkward poses of the figures. Uh, we've seen his work before, again last year, when we studied David in the New Testament. This was his very boyish and, and strong lad, David, uh, with Goliath's head at his feet, very different from Donatella's uh, construction. The reason, one of the reasons that this picture is well known is for this angel's head which was painted by a student in Verrocchio's studio, uh, which housed many artists, Ghirlandaio, uh, uh, Botticelli, others. But here we have Leonardo painting the head of the angel. Very beautiful. Uh, the hair is kind of a trademark Leonardo signature. He loved these long, winding curls, very delicate touch. And there's an apocryphal story that says that when Verrocchio saw what his student was capable of, he gave up the art of painting. Not true. He did continue, but in a much smaller way. He didn't produce nearly as much, really reverted to sculpture. But Leonardo certainly got the, wing, the wind under his sails because he begins creating, as he matures, pictures of John the Baptist. This particular one, very controversial. Some people say it wasn't by Leonardo, uh, that it was by several of his followers or students. Others say it was his. It was damaged and, in fact, corrupted in the 1700s. The cross mark, which should be up here, has disappeared. In fact, it's been painted out. He has received a crown of ivy and 
his uh, skin covering has been covered with spots like a leopard. In fact, he's been transformed into Bacchus, the god of wine. And who knows why that happened, but we have an image that shows that Leonardo fully intended it to be uh, an image of John the Baptist. You can hardly tell by the damage done to the drawing, but up here, right above where I've put the little red line, there is a cross beam showing that this is indeed a cross and that, in fact, this is John the Baptist with his pointing finger indicating that the way is Christ. He must increase. This is definitely by Leonardo, and it's in the Louvre together with the piece we saw before. And many people, I think, misunderstanding it, think that this is too beautiful to be true, that it's effeminate, uh, or at best androgynous, and yet Leonardo's conception of beauty was such that he felt the ideal was a merging of masculine and feminine. So he shows us a John that represents to him all that is, is lovely in the human soul. And he kind of swims up out of the darkness, this uh, background that's undifferentiated darkness. It's almost like those eight balls, if you ever saw them as a child, that you shook and, and ask again later would suddenly appear, or yes is the answer. It he kind of comes up that way, and the technique is called sfumato, the fine shading that produces soft, imperceptible transitions between colors and tones. It's used to create a highly illusionistic rendering of facial features and for atmospheric effects, and Leonardo is the example par excellence of this technique. It comes from the Italian to tone down, or literally to evaporate like smoke. The quintessential rendering of that is this picture, which you all know. Absolutely the paragon of the sfumato technique, especially, excuse me, around the eyes. This is actually a kind of a take on what preceded it, uh, the Leonardo. Clouet was a French court painter, and actually Leonardo is in France at this time, staying with Francis I, Francois Premier, uh, in Amboise, which is where Leonardo died. Clouet certainly saw Leonardo's work and was very affected by it. None of his other work shows nearly these kind of, excuse me, <laughs> I'm getting a little uh, behind myself or ahead of myself. Uh, he never uses this kind of technique in other works. He's clearly imitating Leonardo, and this is very clearly a portrait of Francois Premier seen as John the Baptist with his attributes of the lamb, the agnus dei, and the cross. The parrot, many people have wondered about, and some say it's a sign of wealth and uh, exoticism, of abundance, which certainly existed at Francis's court. I wonder if it also doesn't mean that John the Baptist was merely a voice, which is really all that a parrot is. It's something that just makes a sound that echoes a word. For you to guess, I'm not sure how it might be interpreted. <clears throat> Raphael, clearly influenced at the very same time by Leonardo, uses the same technique. It's not one that Raphael is known for, but again, sfumato to show a very young John the Baptist, a very attractive John the Baptist, Hardly looks 30, does he? Uh, pointing the way on his staff there, pointing to the way of Christ, to he who must increase. Uh, very different sort of take, but one that really grabs hold and painters again and again are going to use this image. What was that hanging on the cross? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm clearly not te technically ept today. That's not hanging on the cross. That's a crucifix. 
That's a cross with light shining off of it, possibly with Christ on it. He may have introduced that, but uh, there's nothing hanging on it except possibly Jesus himself as a foretaste of what's to come. So Del Sarto picking up the same kind of sfumato technique with a very lovely John the Baptist holding in his hand the Agnus Dei scroll for which he is known. Uh, he's holding also down here the bowl with which he baptizes and here is the, the staff which he's known for. Now Caravaggio, you might think, uses the technique of sfumato, but it's actually more than sfumato. It's called chiaroscuro, which is a much more violent, if you will, form of sfumato. Uh, John the Baptist here clearly brooding and almost sulking. Caravaggio was known for his John the Baptists. He painted several that I didn't even bring along because they were almost like child pornography. Really, they were very young men seen nude, laughing and cavorting, which is hardly how you imagine John the Baptist to look. So I really didn't think they would be terribly edifying for you. You can look them up online if you wish. But uh, the technique that I want you to focus on is the chiaroscuro. And Caravaggio is known for it particularly the second paragraph, dark subjects dramatically lit by a shaft of light from a single constricted, often unseen source. Device developed by Caravaggio, crucial in developing the style of tenebrism, literally shadowism, where dramatic chiaroscuro becomes a dominant stylistic device. Chiaroscuro from clear or bright and obscure or dark. He's the master of this. It almost looks like a Studio 90 kind of light on him. It's not a golden, warm, bathing light. It's a sharp light. As you will see here, again, a dark, undifferentiated background. You can't really tell what's going on, nor would you really guess that it's John the Baptist unless you search for his bowl and his staff that's almost hidden here. And here he becomes almost just another sulky youth. Uh, and this is kind of what Car Caravaggio was paid to produce by the Borghese's and others who like to have images of young men round about them. Here is another. I couldn't find one with high, high resolution for the whole image. An even sadder and younger John the Baptist, very melancholic. You can see he's holding his staff, but he's seated, looks very frail, and if you look very close, you get this close-up of the saddest face, and you wonder if it's, and two things come to mind. Either it's a very sad Baptist who is looking toward what Christ is going to face, what he himself may be facing, but it also, and often this was the case with Caravaggio, was just a young street urchin who was bored from sitting and modeling and was just waiting for it to be over. Caravaggio painted this at the end of his life, and his life was one of the most perturbed of all artists. In 1606, he had to flee Rome because he was guilty of a charge of murder. He goes on the lam and eventually ends up, first of all, um, in Sicily and then Naples. He passes by Malta, where he is in favor long enough to do a huge picture of John the Baptist being beheaded for the refectory there uh, in the cathedral, and you can still see it there. But then he's guilty of some unknown crime, is made to leave, eventually makes his way to Naples, where he is uh, kept in secret almost by the Colonna family, because no sooner had he arrived in Naples than he was uh, involved in a street fight that he was going to be arrested for. So they protect him, and he is seeking the patronage again and a pardon from Cardinal Borghese in Rome. And Borghese was known for driving a hard bargain. If he pardoned him, he would expect Caravaggio to appear with at least three paintings. And so Caravaggio sets out for Rome to receive the pardon, three paintings in hand, but he falls sick of some sort of a fever and dies on the way. 
So it's a broken life, and we're seeing the image of that, I think, uh, in this last picture he does of the Baptist. El Greco's Baptist, he painted many of them. This is very, very typical of El Greco with the elongated body, the um, wild colors and light, almost psychedelic. Uh, and it reminds you a little bit of what we saw earlier, that elongated, emaciated Baptist of Donatello. So kind of coming full circle. Now we go to the northern school. If you remember last week, we saw a van der Weyden, which was a nativity scene, the Bladelin triptych. And today we come to this, which is a triptych of John the Baptist's life. You see the birth here on the left and the beheading on the right and the high point of his life here in the baptism of Christ. The 12 apostles are depicted here, and on each of these are grisai, that is uh, gray images imitating sculpture of various events in their two lives. And if we focus in on the center panel, we can see, uh, I'll actually take it up one notch, you can see Zacharias down here, the Baptist preaching, here he's baptizing Christ, and then each of these is a temptation of Christ, which happens, we'll, we'll be studying it next week, right after he receives his baptism and is taken into the wilderness. Here is God the Father speaking his blessing on his son and sending the Holy Spirit down. And you have a beautiful uh, background scene as the northern painters are so well known for. Jesus himself, who is almost in an almond-shaped mandorla, none of the figures there, the Baptist or the angel, interfere with his space. He is framed perfectly in his moment of receiving um, the blessing of the Father. And you can see the oil technique has been mastered fully. The beautiful uh, waves, the clarity of the water is just magnificent. Also, without oil, you would never be able to cr create the fur that you have here. You can almost touch that, that fur. It's so wonderfully done. So that's the triptych. Patiner is the first uh, Flemish painter to think of himself as a landscape artist. And as a matter of fact, his great friend Albrecht Dürer called him a landscape artist. It was the first usage of that term. And you can see that in this image, which is divided by a diagonal. So virtually half of it is landscape with this wonderful, what we call aerial perspective, atmospheric perspective that goes back from the deeper greens here to greenish blues and then fades out into the pale blue taking you into the distance. It's another way of creating perspective. It's not mathematical or linear perspective. It's atmospheric perspective. And you see God the Father here releasing the dove. You see in the distance Jesus coming to John the Baptist who is preaching here and the ultimate resort, uh, result of that, he takes off his blue cloak that he's wearing here and is being baptized. Bruegel is the greatest painter uh, in Holland, the Netherlands, during these years, and they are years of incredible religious strife. Uh, the Anabaptist movement was in full swing, which held that people should have, rather than infant baptism, they should have adult baptism after they had reached the age of accountability. So there was a real war going on about that, and many, many copies of this particular picture of John the Baptist were produced, not just by Bruegel and his sons, but by others. But you can hardly tell where John the Baptist is in this. He's right here, and we can move in a little more closely. The people up in the right we get highly detailed portraits of these people, the onlookers. These folks are highly dressed in very very oriental clothes, and 
This isn't just fancy on Bruegel's part. It's to show that in Antwerp at this time, uh, there was a confluence of wealth and of trade that brought people from all over the world to it as a city. And so you see these very exotic costumes representing the clothing of various countries. So there you have John the Baptist in the midst of the people. This isn't one of Poussin's greatest, but I wanted to show it just because it shows John kind of at his high moment of, of glory without Jesus coming yet. He's just alone doing his own baptism. You can see back in the background a boat, and it's probably Peter and others who were fishermen, and this is probably Peter because he's usually depicted with a beard and so forth. Uh, and they have quit their nets. They're coming forward for baptism here. And no Jesus in sight. These are just followers or possibly critics standing here. But these are all men getting ready for the baptism. It allows Poussin to show people in, in wonderful states of quasi-nudity, musculature and so forth. But it is uh, John's high moment. Rodin. Uh, I just throw this in there to show you how things change uh, from uh, the early days of sculpture. If you look at his feet carefully, you can see that both of them are on the ground, uh, which is an impossible physical position to be in when you're moving. It's very hard to do that. But he wanted to show both movement and solidity, so he gave both uh, legs and feet on, firmly implanted. And he created a monumental sculpture. It is 6-7, I believe, because he'd been accused of surmoulage, that is, creating uh, sculptures by doing a mold of people's bodies. They were so accurate. So he created a great big one to say, look, I can do this. I'm capable of it. There's no human being around who is this big. So that was his point with this picture of John the Baptist, or this uh, sculpture of John the Baptist. Finally, Grunewald, uh, we'll study this in depth a little later, but the same Grunewald that gave you the Annunciation and Nativity last week gives you this this week. We'll look at the crucifixion later, but it's this image of John the Baptist here that I wanted you to see. He's pointing very deliberately at Christ, and his uh, little blurb here is saying, he must increase, I must decrease together with the lamb here who is shedding his blood, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So our final message today, he must increase, I must decrease. I thank you, and we'll look at the temptations next week. Thank you. Thank you.